So we're going to talk about something that kind of runs alongside your work. So anyone who has a, a WordPress website may be using that site to generate, use it uh, in some way, shape, or form to help their. But when we talk about lead gen, we're talking about something that's that's not necessarily what what you think about when you think about building a WordPress website. So the stuff we talk about here applies to WordPress. It also applies to any other website. Okay? Um, and so we're going to start with stuff you likely know. Right? But we still got to cover it, because if we don't cover it, then we, we kind of missed some of the key stuff. Right? So the first thing to note is uh, when we're talking about lead gen, one of the most critical, one of the most important things is that you're clear what problem. If you say, we develop websites for people and we value quality, value integrity, I have some important news for you, right? Nobody's out there saying, we think slotty workmanship and uh, a lack of integrity. But everybody says quality. Everybody says integrity, which means you're saying nothing, right? So if you're out there just like, we just develop really great products, we value our customers, you have to be very clear on what problem you're solving. Right? A problem people actually feel. So you need a real problem and you deliver a real value. If you're not doing that, nothing else that I talk about is going to help you. Right? Because if you're out there with a generic like, we're nice people, you should hire us, that's, that's not going to work. All right. One of the dynamics to understand when we're talking about lead gen is it is a trade. Right? It is an exchange. And that exchange is a quid pro quo that requires value. There's a value exchange. An easier way to understand it, instead of all those right, is a picture. People who arrive at your website have to believe that you actually understand them, that you actually understand the problem, that you actually have a solution that works. I don't know if you've ever been to a website where you were Googling and maybe you were thinking about you and your spouse or you and your friends going on a, on a girl's getaway or a honeymoon or some vacation for family and you Google something and you have a whole bunch of results and you click one of the links. And you think the website looks like it was made before the internet existed, right? Everything about it looks wrong. And the photos don't look shaped the right way. And they're kind of all over the place. It looks like someone just took their MySpace page and brought it to me. And do any of you feel like, I would like to give these people my credit card? No. No, there's no chance, right? Because it doesn't feel credible. And if it doesn't feel credible, you can't put your trust in it. You're not going to put your information into the website. So a lot of times, one of the things to understand is, does professional feel gives us the immediate visceral sense of yes I can trust or uh uh I'm not I'm not clicking again on this website right but it's not just that it's also the reliability of if I if I'm coming to you because I have pain right 50% of people have back pain at some point in their lives if you go to a website and you're looking to solve the back pain do they just have one page on back pain, or do they have a whole? Do you think these guys have been consistently focused on back pain? So, before they give you their email, before they give you their name or their phone number, you have to make sure that the value exchange is solid. Does that make sense? All right. Here's a sad reality. Um, about six months ago, uh, we we were doing an internal study at. The and so we went and grabbed like 600 uh, digital agency websites, right? Si th this, is, this is, you know, professionals that build websites. And these professionals that build websites, we went to their websites. And we looked and all I said was, hey, if they have, I'm not talking about a generic sign up for my newsletter. I'm talking about like if you go to the different service pages and they have different calls to action, give them a point. 
right? If you go to their con- you know, the content, you read the article, and they have a specific call to action from that article, not, hey, if you want, do you want 7,000 more articles like this one, right? Give me your email. If it's specific to, hey, I was talking to you about this kind of service or this kind of uh, thing that we do, and, and if you want more information about this, right? So that it was less than 20% of the digital agencies that we saw had anything specific. 80%, more than 80% of them had, if they had it, if they had it, it was generic. Generic. Sign up for my newsletter. Are you guys good? Yeah. I just don't want him to hurt you, right? Like, you're moving his camera and then he's going to jump up and eat you and then I'm left like looking at this whole thing. I just, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Um, forms. Right, calls to action, uh, ways to learn more. What's the next bit of content? You wrote an article? That's great. What's the next? Finish giving you three minutes of my time. What should I do next? Oh, I just closed my browser tab. Right? Most of us, we have this problem. We have generic action, generic newsletter forms, generic and broad content. And what we're basically saying is, we care about ourselves, right? We created a content calendar, and we said we had to write an article. So we wrote whatever we did, and we shoved it out the door. And we had a newsletter, pay a newsletter subscription service, so we put the form in, and then we walked away from it. And everything about it says, we just put it there because we, someone told us we should put it there. Not because we're trying to solve a problem. Not because we're trying to solve your problem. And if you don't feel like I'm trying to solve your problem, then there's no value exchange. Make sense? All right, and the other component there is liability. For about three years, I wrote on a blog at chrislemma.com, and for three years, every single day, I got up and I wrote about WordPress. Then I didn't write about WordPress. For almost five years, right? For four years plus some days, I wrote like once every two months because my day job took over as WordPress stuff, and so at the end of my day, like, why don't I sit down and write another post about WordPress? So I just walked out of my office, right? And yet, people still would send out forms. People would be on Clarity to talk to me because there was 1,200 posts that said, reliable and know something about WordPress. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to write every day for three years. But what I am suggesting is, if your entire website only has one article or one landing page on one topic, that's not enough for someone to say, I trust them about this topic. It's just not enough. So you get in a marketing company that comes in and says, oh, you need a landing page for, you have three services? Let's give you three landing pages. Not enough. All right, so quick recap of all the stuff we already know. Consistent content, focus on them, right? Their pain, their pain and make distinct call to action that help people feel like, yes, that can solve my problem, knows how to help me. All right, that all makes sense? Awesome. So, most of the time when we talk about lead gen, and I, I run a company where we talk about marketing and lead gen, but I also coach entrepreneurs. Most every time that I coach those entrepreneurs, one of the things they want is growth, and that growth requires some sort of outbound marketing effort, right? And demand gen, and lead gen. And when you get into that conversation, you realize, right? Now, after having coached 30 or 140 CEOs, all have the same four ideas. And so the problem isn't a technology problem. The problem with lead gen is we need fresh ideas. We need some new stuff. Like, I've never tried that. I should try that. Because you don't know what will and won't work. One of my favorite stories is a, a company. I met the owner of this company, but he and I are not friends. I only know from a brief conversation with him, but he had a bunch of T-shirts for his fishing and tackle fish supply uh, boutique store, he had t-shirts and they weren't selling. And they were sitting in a pile. Nobody had a t-shirt. And, uh, and so he was like, I got to do something. I got to do some sort of promotion, right? Um, just to get the t-shirt. The problem with fishing, and in most of your industries the same, is that we all have the same exact holidays, right? So it turns out 
his biggest competition is Father's Day, but so every other fishing and tackle store, including the big guys, they all do a special, they all do deals and sales. Father's Day, so he doesn't get any benefit from that. So he decided, he created Angler's Day. Now, angler is a kind of fish, I think. I don't know enough about fish to tell you if that's true or not, but it also has actual day of the year that was annotated as Angler's Day for physics, and he incorporated it to be Angler Day for fishing. And he declared it, and he said, if anybody spends over $30 or $40 at our store, you get a free t-shirt. He sold stuff on this day that he had to order batches of more t-shirts, right? And then he had his competition calling him going, hey, where did you find out the fish holidays? <laughs> right? And so we're sitting there chatting, and I go, you created your own holiday? That's amazing. He called the county, and we called the state, and we tried to, you know, we registered. This is the official, you know, holiday for this. And everybody showed up and bought on a day when no one else was buying, right? He created his own holiday. This, that's not in my list, right? But just in case, that's just a freebie bonus. Create your own holiday, right? Who knows what could happen? For Steve, every day is a holiday. That's awesome. All right. So let's start with a simple. And by simple, I mean obvious, but you're still not doing it, right? <laughs> you have customers that have had an incredible from working with you. I called them up and I said, hey, tell me what life was like before you started working with Pixel Jar. They're going to go, oh, we, we got ghosted by three different developers. They kept nickel and diming us. Tell me what happened when you got Pixel Jar. Oh my God, I had a clear plan. Everything got delivered under budget. We got everything done. We took the phase we needed. We got results from that. That generated enough revenue to go fund the other phases. It was a dream. And you go, okay, let's How much did you waste on the first thing you developed? $300,000. Right? And you go, oh my God. I didn't charge enough. So how much was our project? Our project was 50 grand. So we outpaced all the stuff. That's amazing, right? Oh, uh, velocity of, of people coming to your website, right? What was the page view? Our website. Two of them were my mom. And you go, OK, and what happened after Pixar? We got this award, we got this award, and we had 20,000 people a month coming to the website. So you write it up. And when you up, you as take an average of five people a month visiting, or maybe it turns out to be 100 people a month, and then you have 20,000 people a month. What is the percentage of that? It's some ridiculous number, right? Because you're like, oh my god, we just increased it by 2,000%. And when you publish that case study, it shows up on the website like this. See how one company increased their their traffic volume by 1,000%. Click here for the details. They click the button. There's no button. They click the button. Up pops up the form. Their email. But they're like, oh, yeah, I'm giving you my email. Because I want to know what they did. PDF, right? I'm not, there's nothing wrong. But what happens? You get so busy doing the project and project and then doing the next project and finishing the project and then doing the next project and finishing the project that you never step back. And you get to a talk like this, you go home, you think, I'm going to do this. And then you start calling nine months ago. If you call a client nine months later, who you are, right? They're not inclined to help you tell the story. But if you finish in the first quarter and they see the difference and you call them after 30 days and you go, hey, chat about how it's going and what's different. By the way, that's a perfect time to just ask, how's it going? So that they say, well, actually, we noticed this, or we would like this, or we'd like to initiate phase two. All of those are wonderful things, but also turn around and you collect it so that you can write the story and you say, hey, I have a, qu I have a quote. Would you have this quote? You can write the quote. You don't have to ask them for it. Write the quote. Send it to them. Do you approve it? Yes, that's perfect. I would say the same. Thank you. And the PDF and push it out. Right? This isn't hard to do, but you have to do it. And you have to do it like clockwork every time you finish a project. Now, 30 days later, you're going to call someone and they're going to say, we went from 100 people 
110 people visiting. That's not a case study. Thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. Hang up and go to the next one, right? Like, it's going to have incredible results. But you don't need every single customer to have incredible results. You need a handful of them. Does that make sense? All right. One of the things that I grew up in the, in the, in the time and, and world that I was living in, proprietary, non-open source, closed source software, one of the things that we lived on was writing algorithms, fixing problems, and hiding it from everyone. Nobody knew our secret sauce. That's how we grew up. Right? We called it intellectual property, although when you read it, sometimes it didn't feel very intellectual. Uh, but, but we did. We called it intellectual property, and we protected it, and we put patents. I wrote a patent. I actually wrote two. And we never wanted to share it with anyone. Right? And that's exactly the wrong option. Right? What you want to do is write it all down, or better yet, videotape the whole thing. Right? The whole thing from beginning to end. Here's how we solve the problem. Show them all, and I mean show them all the minutia, every detail, every bit of it. Put it all out there. I was going to watch it and go, you know, I could do it myself now. Now that I have the video, I can do it myself. But more often than not, smart people, the kind of people you want as customers, they're going to go, well, it's clear you know how to make this work. And also, I have no interest in doing all of that. When you show your work, right, people will go, that's great. How do I reach out to you? And it turns out you can stick a contact form in a video. So. Put it in the video at the end, right? Give them a form. Give them a place where they can say, oh, I, hey, hey, if, you're, if, you know, if you want to download this, click over here. But if you want to reach out because you don't have time to do it and you want us to do it, just fill out this form. We'll follow up with you. Show your work. And as you show it from beginning to end in all the detail, people will go, oh, they know it, and I don't want to do it. I'm just going to have you do it. Does that make sense? All right. A quiz. People ultimately have to make a decision. I don't know what about, but your clients have to make a decision. Uh, imagine we have someone here who's a photographer, right? Imagine that you have a client who's asking the question, should I just take the photos myself or should I hire someone to take it? That is a, that's a problem they have to decide on. So make a quiz, right? Here's a quiz, fill it out, whether you should outsource or take your own photos. Three question quiz, right? At the end of three questions, Collect their email, right? Show them whatever the answer was. But if it turns out that you help them understand they need to hire someone, you're the first person they're going to hire. And you also have their information, right? Does that make sense? You're getting quieter and quieter, and we're only on number four, right? I just want you to know, we can sit here all night. All right, number four, uh, best practice interviews, right? You likely know experts in a space, right, in whatever you're in, you likely know not just that you're an expert, but you know others that are experts. So schedule calls with them, interview them, pull all the data together, and produce the white paper. It's basically just an amalgamation of all the people and what they said. So you're not having to create custom content. You're just pulling it all together, and then you publish something that says, what's the future of AMP according to six top WordPress experts? Download it. Give me your email, and I'll give you this. Right? And they go, oh, yeah, OK, I want that. Value exchange. And you just have to produce something that causes them to say, I'm willing to give you my email for that. Right? All right. How many of you know and love Excel? Oh my god, you guys are awesome. OK, so for years, for years, I hated Excel. And then went by, and all of a sudden, one day, I was in a, in a podcast, and someone asked me, what software do you use every single day? And I thought about it for a second, and I, went, I looked down at my computer, and, I thought, and I'm like, oh, I use Excel every day. And then I realized what came out of my mouth. And I was like, oh my god, I use Excel every day. Like, I've become one of those people. <laughs> Excel people know formulas, right? Excel people don't type in, you know, like, A3 plus whatever, because they know you start with an equal sign. Excel people, if you're sitting there right now vibing with me, you're like, yeah, that's exactly right. You're an Excel person. And here's the thing. There's a whole bunch of the world that isn't. So imagine, right, what happens when you have a pre-done worksheet with formulas in for your space or industry. 
right? Someone said something about wedding, boutique wedding sites, right? Yeah. So imagine if you were like, how to calculate the cost of flowers at your wedding. Download our worksheet. And, you, and they go, oh. and you're like, yeah, just put in how many groomsmen, how many bridesmaids, uh, what kind of location, this, 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 how big is the square footage, da, da, da. And then it just cranks it everything out and goes, okay, here's how many flowers of each type, and then here's the ones you picked, and so therefore here's the total budget from here to here. And people go, oh, my God, if you have a spreadsheet like that, yes, I will give you my email if I can download something where I don't have to fill in all the formulas. I can just put it in there. I did a video once of uh, um, how to do a, a cost model for starting a new company, right? And the whole thing, I did the whole video sheet, and, uh, and I wrote a blog post about it. And I thought people were going to come back to the blog post and comment on it, whatever. Um, they didn't care. They didn't care about the blog post. They barely cared about the video. They were like, um, that spreadsheet that you already filled out, could you please, where's the link to that? I just want to download the spreadsheet, right? Because as they watched it, they were like, oh, he put, and then he put another, and then he put a derivative of that formula here. I need that spreadsheet. There are all sorts of people like that, and they give you their information for it. And at the same time, you're communicating, I'm an expert in this space. I know, the, the thing is this, if you ask me about how to price flowers at a wedding, I know two variables number of people, and how expensive the flowers are, right? But when you talk to an expert, they're like, there's 17 variables. And that's the value, right? Is that most of us walk around with a very rudimentary mental model of something. And you have the details of a more expanded, more serious mental model of how the real world works. And when you put it in a spreadsheet, you're demonstrating that expertise. All right. Have you created an email course. Most marketing uh, automation tools today will allow you to go in and put a sequence of five emails, right, and drop on your website. And someone fills it in, in the sequence, one email every week or one email every day, however you want to do it, and four or five emails. You are, again, communicating your expertise, but people love to learn. And if you have something that people are going, wow, that is, this is great. I need this stuff, right? Um, Steve, you did one that was how to choose a digital partner, right? How to, how, to hire an how to hire an agency, right? Do you know how awesome that is? Think about it for a second. Someone show agency. Are they likely going to only look at one digital agency? They're going to look at five others. So what do you do? You put landmines on everybody else you know, right? So imagine, right? Shh. Imagine that Steve has a benefit in that his team is local in the US. So imagine if on day three of his email he says, now make sure you ask, where are the people located that are doing the work? If they're located in the US, that's great. If they're not located in the US, make sure that you understand and ask, what does that mean for turnaround times? Because potentially something that should take two hours might take three days. The person reads it and then goes to the next website and gets on a phone call and says, hi, where, uh, where's your team located? And they go, well, we have people all over the world. Oh, great. On my kind of project, where would they be located? Well, uh, Eastern Europe as well as uh, here and there. And you go, oh, okay, thank you. And they hang up. And the guys on the phone are like, what happened? What just happened? Like, we just stepped on a landmine and we don't even know what happened. And Steve's like, I know what happened. I planned that, right? <laughs> your email courses can be useful not just because you're educating, they can also set up barriers against your competition. All right. Upgrade. Okay. So uh, imagine that I write a blog post that says um, the top plugins of 2020. And then imagine I write a different post that is how to choose the right membership plugin for your site. And the third article I write is um, maybe you don't need an LMS for your online course. Maybe you just need a membership plugin. Okay? So I have three different articles. They're all about membership plugins, but they're taking different slants on the material. I can take each of those articles and save the content into a PDF while still on my website, right? So I have the three articles on my website. 
but they weren't written one day after another, so they don't show up in a nice little list. They're just all over the website, right? Now, when you're in the middle of reading one of them, there's a little special box. It's highlighted. It has a nice boundary around it. It's bright yellow. It's highlighted, and it says, want to learn how to choose the right membership plugin for you? Click here. Pops open. They fill in their email and information, and I send them the PDF of the other article. Now, I go to the other article, right, and it's, you know, how to choose, da, da, da. And there's a little call out in the middle of it that says, do you want to see a comparison of the top seven plugins, membership plugins for 2020? And they go, yes, that's great. Click the button, it pops up, they put in their email, they get the PDF. Now, all I'm doing is changing the medium of the content, right? One of them is the website, the other is a PDF. But I'm also cross-linking them, putting them in the middle of the article as a call out so that people think, this is an upgrade to the content I just read, hence the term content upgrade. Like, yes, I was going with this, but now look at this. This is extra information. If you ever want to see this, Insta page is a company that has, all they do is landing pages. Right? I mean, not all they do, but they're, they're a major player in the landing page for the corporate world. And it doesn't matter what article you read. There is a content upgrade. There is a button to click and a pop-up and a landing page for every single article they have, right? Bouncing you around different places so you can download and they're just collecting information. They're also collecting on what you cared about, what you clicked on, so they know more about you. All right. Are you creating checklists? It was, if I was hiring a photographer, I would write an article that says, the 276 things you need to know before you hire, well, probably not that much, but 27 things you need to know before you hire a photographer. The 30 things you have to do before you launch a WooCommerce website. The 16 things you have to check off before you choose a host. The 32, it's just a checklist. And what people feel like is, I don't know if this is going to be awesome or not, but I don't want to miss out on potentially making a mistake. So a checklist becomes really useful to people. Make sense? All right, number nine. Uh, are you creating scenes content, right? How many of you have a podcast? A couple of you, okay? If you have a podcast, you know that there's always that dynamic where you're interviewing someone and you're talking, you're talking, and then you're done. You, you know, you, you're like, that's the episode. And then you chat for another 30 minutes, right? Or maybe you chat for 30 minutes before you start the episode. And you're like, this is golden stuff. Like, people would love this. So what do you do? Take that, spin it up in a private feed, Set up an account with Glow, right? And uh, people can pay you for behind the scenes content. Not just get leads, you can actually get paid for that, right? And it's not just for a podcast, right? You create a video, right? So you create a video, but what did you have to do before you create the video? You had to set up your studio. So shoot the behind the scenes of setting up the studio and then make it available for your members, right? Hey, if you want to see, if you want behind the scenes on how we did this, because what happens? Most of the time we watch and we see two things. When we watch video, we see the content that was produced, right? The information delivery. And then we also see the quality of what was produced. And sometimes we think, I want that. How do I do that? And they have a, oh, do you want behind the scenes? Sign up to be our membership or sign up to get over here and, or just click over here to this page that has our information. And I give you my information in order to go behind the scenes. Oh my gosh, we're happy there. <laughs> Number 10, are you taking your content and publishing it somewhere else? Product Hunt is a website for people who build new products, right? They have a new product, a new plugin, a new screen. People are cheating now. They're putting eBooks on that thing. So cheat with them. If you're an eBook, go put it in other places. Go put it on Reddit. Go put it on Product Hunt. Go put it anywhere where your different audience that you with hangs there if you bring some people your way. Okay? Publish your scripts and templates. I can't tell you enough about a friend of mine named Jennifer Bourne who literally took all the scripts and all the templates of everything her agency did for 10 years. She turned it into a, a product and agency after agency bought it. Because they're like, why, why would I want to create these emails on my own? 
Why wouldn't I want to see other people's emails, especially if I read it and I go, oh my God, that's so much better than mine. And you just copy and paste, right? You have scripts. You have templates. I have a little trick. I could write an I think at some point I did write an entire article about my trick of not answering non-questions, right? I don't know if you've ever been on one of those calls where you're talking, you're doing a pitch with a customer and the customer says, or the prospect says, oh, that seems kind of expensive. What they want you to do is react, but they didn't ask a question. So I just sit there silently and wait and wait and wait. The rest of my team is on the call. They're on Slack. They're like, did, did you lose connection? Are you okay? You're not saying anything. And I'm like, just wait. 60 seconds go by and they go, well, I guess if you can keep it under 60 grand. And my team's like, oh my God, we were going to do 20 grand. And I'm like, yeah, we can definitely keep it under 60 grand. Right? And you're like, yeah, I made, I made 40 grand off silence for 60 seconds. But most of us can't be silent for a long time. But I wrote it out. I wrote out, here's exactly how to do it. I wrote out, here's how to pay for Steve's lunch. Right? Doesn't matter what you know. You know something, write it down. Because someone else is going to come alongside and say, gosh, this is perfect. I just want to take it and use it myself. All right. If you know experts in the space, you can create a virtual summit. Last year, we were, I don't know, March or April? No. Yeah, probably about April or May. And uh, I got a call from my marketing team. And they said, we need a way to engage a bunch of uh, micro agencies, like one, two, three person agencies, freelancers, we need a way to reach them. And I said, no problem. Uh, we'll just create a virtual summit. They're like, well, okay, what's that? We'll just, we'll just run what, like this, right? Except online. And so we'll have people they're like, well, what do we do? I'm like, oh, here's your 10 topics. And hold on a second. And I sent texts to 10 of my friends or nine of my friends. And I said, would you speak on this topic? Would you speak on this topic? I pinged Steve and I just said, you're speaking on this topic. And he said, okay. Right. And, uh, Within two days, right, we had a makeshift, makeshift logo, uh, the name of the event, uh, 10 speakers, 10 topics, and then we had a, a virtual summit software that I pointed them to, and I said, just go here, load it all in, and by June, right, uh, they had announced and published and all this stuff, and we had thousands of people show up to this virtual summit, which also generated a bunch of leads that then our marketing team could go chase down, right? If you know people in your space, a virtual summit is not hard to do. There's a piece of software that I use called Hey Summit. And Hey Summit is among many other. There's a lot of these different ones. But it's really, really easy and fairly inexpensive. Right? It does not have to be a complicated thing to create a virtual summit. All right. Um, I understand that there are people that have opinions about LinkedIn. I don't care about their opinions. Um, because LinkedIn is the social network for mostly old white men um, who have money, right? They got in LinkedIn when people were like, it's either LinkedIn or Facebook, and they went LinkedIn. I swear to God, if you have ever had a choice between a customer who chose Facebook that day or the ones who chose LinkedIn that day, you know you want the LinkedIn people, right? <laughs> like if they're sitting there going, I don't know, should I, should I join Facebook or LinkedIn? You're like, oh, the LinkedIn people all the time. LinkedIn very tame network. It's not fancy. Don't, people don't post pictures of their food. They don't tell you how they're doing. They don't care about how you're doing, but use it for networking. And in general, while a whole bunch of young people are like, this is a waste of time, older folks, right, people my age are like, oh yeah, it's useful. It's helpful. So did you know they have an ad network? And did you know that you can join the ad network and create a form? And did you know you can take that form and integrate it into your active campaign or other solutions? right into your marketing automation solution, and you can if you know if you didn't, now you have homework. All right. This is one of my all-time favorites. I know a bunch of agencies who say, no, if they send me an RFP, I just throw it away. I don't do RFPs. My response to them is, you're a moron, right? Um, because what you should be doing is you should be creating the RFP template. If you create the RFP template and you just leave it available, right? I see it. If you, if you leave it available and people come and download it and use it, at the stage for you being the best candidate because you defined the criteria 
that you consume to you back. Into the process early and tell people this is what's important about hiring a digital agency or hiring a boutique you know, location or professional or whatever. If you're defining the criteria, you have a much better chance of winning. Yeah, you have a question? A request for proposal. Sorry, that's a great question. So uh, what happens is in the, in, the, in, the, in the corporate setting, when someone they often don't just say that vendor. Instead, they send out a questionnaire, and they send out to a bunch of people. And often you have to write 20 to 50 pages of content. And you ha I mean, it's, you know, they, they, they put a, a um, stethoscope in all sorts of places to get information that you don't really like sharing. But if you can define the template and tell people, here's what you should do, especially when they don't know anything, change the nature of how they're looking at the options, right? Uh, a lot of times, RFP uh, answers. If the only thing you get away with is redefining which things are important and which things aren't important, which I have done several times, um, it's amazing, right? Like, there was a stretch where we won three or four RFPs, and everyone was like, what happened? How did we, like, what's going on, right? And then they looked in, and what we had done is we'd written some stuff and created some templates that basically took some of the things that we were horrible at, and we said, these are stupid things that are not important. And they should count for 10 points. And we took the things that we were really good at, and we said, this is the most critical thing, and they're worth 100 points. So we suck at five things, and it didn't ding our score at all, right? Um, eventually, you know, word got out, because marketing people have big mouths, and uh, we, had to, you know, we had to compete on, on everything else. But at the end of the day, this is a nifty little trick. All right. Um, your opinion on social media on whether or not Twitter is good or Pinterest is good or whatever is immaterial. The opinion that matters is whether your prospect, the lead that you care about, what their opinion is. And if their opinion is that Twitter's awesome or Facebook's great or Pinterest is the best place to be in the earth, then you need to be listening there, right? And so you have to go and figure out, how do I listen? What tools can I use to listen? And how do I get in those conversations? Um, I speak at events a lot. And uh, often, if I'm going to a, a conference that's going to have hundreds of people, I know that when I come off the stage, they're going to get a business card, and I say no. But I can say, oh, go to chrislemma.com slash and whatever initials most correlate to that event. And I have a dedicated landing page for that event, which may include a special offer. It gives a lead gen form where they can give me their information. And because I'm someone who coaches entrepreneurs, especially as I'm talking to them, I may say, oh, Go to this page because I have a promotion for my coaching that could help you, right? And by the way, you are speaking at events, right? Right? That's important. Uh, landing pages for podcasts you're on, right? If you're on a podcast, uh, I got invited on a Monday to be on a podcast on a Friday, right? They, they lost their, their person, so it was last minute. They're like, hey, is there any way you can do this? And if you know me, you know that I can get on a podcast with like 20 minutes to spare. So five days was beautiful. And they said, we have, this is, this is a different kind of thing. It's not a record the podcast and then, and then we'll publish it later. This is a live event. So we're going to have 5,000 people listening in. We're going to do this thing. And if you have a special offer, right, um, we can end with you giving, giving out your special offer. I had nothing. But my topic was on storytelling. And I can do that all day long. So I went to, I, I went to Google and I typed in uh, tips, storytelling tips. And I got a bunch of websites. I grabbed those websites and I stuck all the URLs without ever looking at the articles, all in a spreadsheet. Then I gave the spreadsheet to my daughter, who's sitting right here, and my wife. And I said, go through every one of these links on Monday and grab any of the tips and stick them in the next sheet so that you have a sheet that is filled with tips. And they did that. Tons and tons of tips from all these websites about storytelling. And I said, now delete all the duplicates. So they deleted all the duplicates. And I said, OK, that's great. I said, now I'm going to give you a framework that I use. So this is how we prepare content. This is how we prepare materials. 
uh, you know, the, so prepare the story, prepare the materials, and this is how we deliver the, the talk, right? Three buckets. Pick these tips and just check off where they fall in. So they did that. They gave me the spreadsheet. I looked it over and I went, that's a bad idea. That's a bad tip. That's a bad tip. They forgot these five, and I put in my own five, right? Tuesday night, I recorded 42 three-minute videos. Okay, I just took each tip and I just recorded a three-minute video. One after another, after another, after another. 43 videos, three minutes each, is not a lot of time, right? On Wednesday, I put it on a website, just a long list in sections with links to the videos that popped up. And then I made the cost of, the, of this new course, I made the cost $999. Then I created a coupon that was the name of the podcast event that I was going to. And I made it, I think, something like uh, $25. Okay? And then I get on the podcast. We do the podcast. And at the end, I said, oh, I have a landing page that you can go to that has my Storytellers Cafe uh, course on there. It's normally $999. But for you guys, because you've been listening and we've been talking about all this stuff, I'm taking off 99%, right? I'm just telling you right now, it's 25 bucks. I made $20,000 in one day, okay? And I gave none of it to my daughter or wife, <laughs> right, right? This, these things, this is just a matter of, okay, what do you, and, and what did I care, right? Whether I made 20 grand or I made 200 bucks, what do I care? But it was a ton of emails because those people all came to that website and all that information. And now I had a whole list of people that were interested in storytelling for business, which allows me to do all sorts of things with them afterward. Does that make sense? Dean, are you giving your customers discounts when you recommend them, right? Your customers may recommend other people. Make it easy for them to tell you who those people are. I am a timeshare guy, right? Which is hard, you know, most people are like, ooh, timeshares are horrible. I'm in two different timeshare programs, and in those programs, I'm in the top 5% and 1% of the world, right? So Hill and Grand Vacation people know my name, and Las Posadas people know my name, and when I go to Cabo, and I go to this five-star resort, I get a hug when I get out of the car, right? Like, I, I could live in Cabo for like nine months off the points I have. I run a conference down there. I love this stuff. Do you know what every timeshare company in the world does? Whether you buy or don't, at the end of the presentation, they slide a little form to you and they say, now, are there other people that you think would really like this program? Now, this is a very good reason why you should keep Steve's name, email, and phone number in your phone. Because it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I give them his name, right? Just be like, oh yeah, my buddy Steve would love this. Put him on every list, right? But they're asking for a lead. And they're not bashful. They're, whether you bought or didn't buy, they just go, hey, this has been a great conversation, really loved our time together. Uh, do, you know, do you have any friends that you think would be interested in this? And I go, yeah, here you go, here's two people, right? Ask for a lead. Number 19, are you creating contests? I went to a chiropractor down in downtown San Diego. I live in San Diego, by the way. Down downtown San Diego, I go down there, I go to this chiropractor and I see a huge poster board on his wall and it says, Free sweet tickets to the Padres. And you're like, what? what's that? So you get closer and you look it up and you realize, what do you think? Hey, if you're the person that makes the most referrals to our company in a given month, that's your price. People, they don't want money, right? A referral, bonus, money, whatever, that doesn't motivate them. Sitting in a suite, Oh, yeah, you're going to be business cards all day long. Create a contest. Number 20. I know we say pop-ups work. We say we hate pop-ups, but we can be very effective and really interesting with them. Pop-ups are fantastic if you use them right. Using them wrong is horrible. But if you monitor where people are visiting so that you understand their behavior, Random, in fact, isn't random at all, can be very, very powerful. I'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, so we're going to wrap up now. What tool should you be using? 
Well, hey, in the WordPress space, Everybody, if you're going to be doing lead gen, you're going to need a couple key components every time. You're going to need some sort of page builder if you want to build the landing pages, right? You're going to need a form so you can collect information, and you're going to need uh, some opt-in stuff, right? Something that catches them before they leave or when they're on a certain page. So Beaver Builder and Elementor are great page builders. Uh, Ninja Forms, Gravity Forms, WP Forms are great form builders. Uh, opt-in Monster, Convert Pro, and Bloom are great opt-in plugins, okay? By the way, I'll post these links. I'll post a link to all these slides so you have them. But these, these plugins are all awesome. They all do great things. But here's what I'm going to tell you, OK? Everybody done taking the photo? I don't want to change it too soon. You don't need all those. Okay. It's, it's unpopular. But here's the thing, right? Every plugin you add to your website is going to add a little bit of weight to that site. It's also going to create the potential for a dependency conflict, one plugin and another. This is just math. The more plugins you add, the more dependency conflicts are potentially possible. It doesn't mean that they're all going to slow your website down. Some of them may, some of them may not. But what do you really need? I'm going to tell you you need two things. A SaaS product called ConvertFlow and a marketing automation tool. You're going to say, uh, I don't know, I've never heard of ConvertFlow. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you the screenshot here, right? But on the left side, what you're seeing is the logic for a quiz. On the right side is the quiz. This is my How Can I Help You page at chrissummer.com. And if you click on Need Help, you get, hey, I, I answer questions you by the minute on a clarity call. But I also do coaching. I also speak at events. I, these are all the different ways that I can help you. And then you see a little quiz on the right side that says, Trying to choose between clarity calls and coaching, right? This quiz, and you click the button. You click the button, you answer three questions. Three questions, you get a, a little place to put your email, and then it gives you the logic. The logic, you should use clarity and pay by the minute, or we should talk about a, a coaching engagement. The logic is over here on the left. I used to do that conditional logic in Ninja Forms. I used to use a form builder to build out that kind of logic, but they do it. I used to use Beaver Builder to do uh, page layouts, right? And yet, landing pages, they do, right? They do forms. They do pop-ups. They do sticky bars. They do landing pages. They do and they do quizzes. They do it all. And in terms of page weight, they put a little bit of JavaScript, one line, on your website. Everything else is handled in their SaaS. And you're like, yeah, no duh. And they integrate with marketing automation solutions. Which means when someone fills in that quiz, right, I can send them to any of the right? If my website, website is driven by Active Campaign, I can send it to Active Campaign and I can add data, right? Which means if you come visit my site and you go through that quiz and it, and it sends your email into me, it can also send me the tag or the content that you filled out. So the first question of the quiz is, what kind of problem are you having? Now you've given me that data. Now I know more about you. And if I know more about you, guess what? I'm going to send you an email about content you care about, not content you don't. You're likely going to say, well, which one should I use here? It doesn't matter. They're all close enough. Active campaign has ton of integrations. Autopilot has less integrations, but their workflow builder is the easiest one of them all. Drip in between has a lot of integrations and has a lot of power in their builder, but it's not as easy to use. And ConvertKit has a line of everything. It's cleaner and easier if you're getting started, right? The stuff you're going to do, they're all going to be fine. The point of the marketing automation is make sure that you get the right, you know, the right person. It's to make sure that you connect to people, to the right people, in the right way. My name's Chris Summa. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Summa, or of course on my blog, chrissummer.com. Thank you very much.